Welcome to the Gooder Podcast, where we talk with powerhouse women in CPG about their journeys to success. This episode is sponsored by Retail Voodoo, a brand development firm guiding mission-driven consumer brands to attract new and passionate consumer base, crush their categories through growth and innovation, and magnify their social and environmental impact. If your brand is in need of brand positioning, package design, or marketing activation, we are here to help. You can find more information at www.retail-voodoo.com. Hi, this is Diana Freik. I'm the host of the Gooder Podcast, where I get to talk with powerhouse women in the food, beverage, and wellness categories about their journeys to success and the insights on the industry. Thanks for joining us today. This episode is brought to you by Retail Voodoo. Retail Voodoo is a brand development firm. Our clients include Starbucks, Kind, RAI, PepsiCo, Hi-Key, and many other market leaders. We provide strategic brand and design services for leading brands in the food, wellness, and beverage and fitness industries. If your goal is to increase market share, drive growth, or disrupt the marketplace with new and innovative ideas, give us a call and let's talk. You can find out more about Retail Voodoo at retail-voodoo.com or simply email me at info at retail-voodoo.com to learn a little bit more. Well, before introducing today's guest, I just really want to give a big thank you to Dr. Jeremy Weiss of Rise 25 for connecting me with our guest today. Rise 25 specializes in helping B2B businesses reach their dream 200 clients by using podcasts. If you're interested in learning more, you can check them out on rise25.com. Okay. Well, on to the, the best of or the gooder stuff. Hey, today I'm excited to do, introduce Holly Lyman, the founder and queen bee of Wild Tonic, a brand of good omen bottling. Holly is an encaustic artist from Alaska who mastered the ancient art of June kombucha, among other ferments. You'll have to explain that a little bit more soon, Holly. Uh, Holly takes great pride in promoting women into management and as it's an important part of the foundational work she set for her company. Well, Miss Holly, hello. How are you? I'm doing great today. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. Of Diana. course. Where, where are you calling from today or where are calling from? Where are you today? Well, I live in Sedona, Arizona, the Red Rock country. And, and today I'm calling you from our headquarters where our brewery is located in Cottonwood, which is right outside of Sedona, about 20 minutes. Okay. You know, so funny when I was, uh, when we first were talking, I got myself all turned around and I heard you're from Alaska and I assumed that you were still in Alaska but you're in Arizona, so completely different. It's yes, so by design, by design. That's what happens <laughs> when you grow up in such a cold place. You seek just the opposite mm -hmm. when you have your senses about you and, and you're able to make decisions on your own. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm third generation Alaska. So um, my grandparents homesteaded up there. And really? I have a lot of family up there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and before you made it to Arizona, of course, you were here in Seattle for a great deal of time. Where, oh, wow. where you were, that's where you were really practicing your art at, probably at your peak. Is that correct? So I had two phases of my art career in Seattle. One yes. was I was involved in the contemporary studio glass movement and managed oh. a very well-known artist named William Morris for mm -hmm. 20, over 20 years mm -hmm. until he retired in 2007. And he's part of the whole Pelchuk Glass School, Dale Chihuly, oh. you know, that whole movement that yeah. happened and really is centered in Seattle area. Mm. Um, but then when he retired, I had to reinvent myself. So I started painting with encaustic art, which is beeswax. And yes. I really became very passionate about that and had galleries in Sun Valley and Seattle and um, Palm Desert and really just um, enjoyed that uh that medium for about eight years until I discovered fermenting and then fermenting really caught my attention and passion because it it really is the missing link in our health it's mm. something that um really spoke to me from the sense that you know everything used to be um 
you know, fermented to preserve food. And right. then the advent of refrigeration came around and all of a sudden, all of these microbes that were there to help our health um, weren't there anymore because right. everything has preservatives in it, it's refrigerated. And so I saw this fermenting is really the way to um, to close the gap. And I started fermenting anything and everything from my home in Eastern Washington. Um, okay. And yeah, discovered the, the gen culture, which is what wild tonic is. Oh my goodness. So, well, so let's talk about that. Let's start off with the brand. Tell us about wild tonic, why it exists. And, and you also have to talk about whether or not in caustic painting and this honey fermentation is in any way, shape or form related. It, it is related in the sense that both are things, both passions are uh, the work of the bees. Mm-hmm. So the encaustic is, encaustic art is a, and it's also, they're both lost forms of art that have been resurfaced and yeah. come back into vogue in our culture. Mm-hmm. So encaustic art is a very, uh, it's a contemporary art form. Um, there's a book called Encaustic Art of the 21st Century, and you can find my work in there. It was published a few years back, wow. right when I started fermenting. And then I had to basically pull my work out of all of the galleries and, sure. and really focus on the brewery because it is really a full time full time yeah. job mm-hmm. at Wild Tonic. And yeah. what, so why Wild Tonic? Why did you go in this direction? Well, because... The Jan culture, which is, um, it's a kombucha, it's a cousin of kombucha. It's a very okay. rare cousin of kombucha. Okay. Um, and Jan rhyme, rhymes with fun. So I always think it's, you know, it's it's one of those ancient ferments that um, was known for as like an elixir of life um, and enlightenment. Mm-hmm. They think it might have originated in Tibet, but the, there's a lot of folklore around where it originated. But they mm-hmm. say that it might have even predated regular kombucha because honey was around before sugar was around. Right, and of so course. they say that the monks used it for energy and, um, you know, that they passed the culture on and, but it never was commercialized until I started wild tonic. It was a very, it's almost taboo to brew it. Really? And so I really like taboo things. I really, <laughs> I really like to, you know, delve into, you know, the outside of the box thinking. Yeah. As an artist, I think it's important to always challenge yourself and so um, and, and to reinvent yourself. So I started brewing with this this gem culture and, you know, I, I found the flavor profile to be unlike any other in, you know, in ferment. It was just like a champagne almost. It oh, doesn't really? have the vinegar overtones that normal kombucha mm-hmm. does. So I've had so many people who can't drink normal kombucha just fall in love with wild tonic because it is very um very champagne like and has mm. a very different uh taste on the palate than a normal kombucha mm. does and so i came to vaca- i came to vacation here in sedona in 20 about 2014 and absolutely in the fall of 2014 absolutely fell in love with it you know the, i was staying in a little cabin right on oak creek with a fireplace at a uh, local resort here and then I was like, okay, I just have to move here. This is where this ferment has to be born because mm. ferments are unusual. I mean, in that if you think about ferment uh, from San Francisco, it's going to mm-hmm. taste very different uh, sourdough bread from San Francisco than yeah. a sourdough bread from New York because right. they're all influenced by the yeasts in the air. Mm-hmm. And so Sedona has its own um, energy, its own vibe. It's extremely... Yes high energy, high vibration. There's a lot of vortexes here and a lot of spiritual new age movements happening here because, Mm -hmm. you know, of the environment. And so Mm -hmm. I thought, what a better place to create this drink than Sedona. Um, It is a bit off the beaten path and, but it's so um, it's, we've really uh, brought a lot of experts in from the beverage industry to support the brewery and to to move it forward. Yeah. Yeah. So very interesting. Yeah. So, but you've now you've got wild tonic kind of under a, under the good omen bottling. Does that mean that there's other coming out or is that just kind of the original formulation of the, of the business? 
Um, it's just the original formulation gotcha. of the business, but we do have an alcohol variety as well that I mm. developed two years after the non-alcohol variety. Mm-hmm. So we have a 5.6% ABV kombucha. We were the first in the country to come out with a hard jun kombucha. Oh. And we were, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually very cutting edge. We were named uh, most innovative beverage of the year in 2017 for our alcohol. Hmm. by uh, by beverage industry magazine so that's kind of fun that's super fun that's wonderful hmm well can you talk a little bit about the early days now you said you had this new idea right and you started working on it I, I I everybody has their own kind of first year's stories Talk talk a little bit about what that transition was like for for you as an artist mm-hmm. in one sense because you know cr- becoming a brewer is that your is that the yeah. technical term becoming a brewer is yeah. it's in itself its own sense uh, form of art but mm-hmm. it's different yeah. so talk a little bit about those early years in that transition sure so I started reading um, anything I could get my hands on on fermentation. And one of the authors that really stood out was Sandor Katz. And he wrote a book called The Art of Fermentation. It won a James Beard Award. Okay. Beautiful book about traveling across the world and documenting ferments from various cultures around the Mm -hmm. world. And Mm -hmm. I was, you know, I thought, well, he's never going to respond to me if I email him, you know, but I did because I happened to be. Um, traveling in Tennessee and just wanted to meet him. So he invited me to come out to his fermentation uh, studio out in the middle of Backwoods, Tennessee, I swear. He's like, I'm going to have to meet you at a local (laughs) coffee shop and find you out there because you'll never find it otherwise. And boy, was he ever right. It's like all these little windy roads through, you know, the backcountry. No electricity was out there. It was Mm -hmm. very off grid. But I did bring my first formulation of wild tonic to share with them. And I was all excited to share it with them. And, yeah. and so I opened it up and I was like, well, what do you think, Sandor? And he looked at me and he said something that will just change my whole reality, which was, Holly, there are no rules in fermentation. And so that gave me the permission as an artist to really mm-hmm. push the boundaries. And mm-hmm. that's what I did with the alcohol ferment is, yeah. you know, there was no recipe for how to make an alcohol version of a kombucha at that time we were the second actually to be released in the country so it was very very cutting edge and we had to go through like two years of uh struggles with the federal ttb the the um the arm of the government that regulates alcohol and approves formulations and all of that because they had Mm -hmm. no idea what what even we were so are you a beer are you a wine are you a spirit so Yes. Yeah, it was it was an adventure. The beginning days were very, um, you know, uncertain because there's no books on how to start a kombucha brewery. We had to design all of our own equipment. It was very, um, it was an adventure. A lot of uh, trials and tribulations, a lot of mistakes. You know, there were times in the very beginning when we hand bottled everything. You know, yeah, we had course. 300 bottles a day. Mm. And now we have a canning line that does that in probably a few minutes. So, you know, it's, um, it's a very different reality now. Yeah. Very different reality. Yeah. I, I can imagine it was there. I, I feel like you've already answered this, but there might be another, was there a singular turning point or a moment where you were like, yep, I'm, I'm headed in the right, right direction. Me, Holly, or the brand is headed in the right direction. Do you have a moment or two of those to share with us? Oh my goodness. I would say, um, yeah, when, I mean, I guess when you're out hiking on a trail and you're wearing a wild tonic t-shirt and people get all excited because they see it, you know that you're on the right track because it's becoming like a common thing, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. uh, something that people recognize or, um, you know, I see your blue bottles everywhere. You know, I hear that a lot here, especially here in Arizona, because we're so prevalent here in Arizona. Um, but it, it's, you know, when you, I guess, um, my goodness, I would have to say it was probably early on in, in our, uh, career or in the, in the brewery when 
Uh, we, we got into UNFI and CAHI, which are two of yeah. the largest natural foods distributors in the country. Mm-hmm. And then we were able to really go nationwide. I think that mm-hmm. was a real turning point because mm-hmm. when we first opened, we self-distributed and you can only deliver so much out of your little van, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. It, it was really getting national distribution by two of the biggest players that, that yeah. was a game changer. Well, so you guys started in 2015, is that right? Yeah, in May yeah. of 2015. So it's only been six years. So when, which in the life of an entrepreneurial brand is really still on the young side. So when, when, when was this KHE and UNFI mi- miracle? The miracle, it's a Christmas miracle. Yeah, uh, probably uh, in about year two. Really? Okay, so yeah. you guys were really on to something here and you 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 caught the eye of some some real retailers and real distributors in just 2 yeah. years time. Yeah, we were in Natural Grocers was our first chain. Yeah. Um to take on our brand that was a large chain. And then Sprouts took us on and Whole Foods Market and now Safeway. Safeway is one of our biggest um, really? clients now. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. And do you feel like, and I don't know, I don't know if this makes sense. Do you feel that it was more about the product or do you feel like it was more about the brand and the mission of the brand what, or, or it could be equal, but what do you think was really connecting with these distributors? I think it's the product. It's the flavor profile. If I had to say one thing that really stands out about our brand, it's, you know, people really become addicted to it. I've Mm -hmm. actually been to Safeway before and I saw this gentleman loading up his cart literally with 20 bottles of wild tonic. And I thought he was a merchandiser at the time. And I was about ready to go up and say, Hey, is there a recall or something like what's going on? (laughs) Did you take us off the shelf? (laughs) Right. And then he wanders up produce and starts putting carrots in his cart. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That's a customer. You know, that's pretty cool. So that's kind of, that's the traction moment that, right? Like that's when you as an entrepreneur or a brand, let's be honest, if you're a brand owner for any company uh, and you are walking into a market and you're seeing your brand being loaded up, like that is the moment where you know, traction has happened. It's happening. Yeah. 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 And I've seen that happen a few times, actually. So it's not like, it's not an isolated event, but again, this is our home. This is our hometown. So I'm going to say here more than I would say if I was traveling in New York, if I'm in New York, I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's wild tonic, you know, but if if I'm in Arizona, it's, um, you know, it's just going to be more likely to gain a lot more traction in our backyard. When you think back to your to your time, um, I'm wondering if you have, you know, if there's kind of a big challenge that you had to overcome professionally to to start. I don't know if you've, it's at, at any point to mm-hmm. kind of just see the impact that you wanted to make in in the community or in the marketplace. Is there something that, um, boy, you wish you could have foreseen and that you'd like to just shed some light on? Um, I would, I would say, yeah, I could have never foreseen COVID coming. Well, yeah. Um, that was a major challenge for the company because we had a lot of keg sales at our restaurants. Oh, really? Okay. And all of okay. our keg sales, which was a very significant part of our business disappeared overnight. And yeah. that was a huge challenge. And then, um, that same year, COVID year, which was this last year, I also, um, my husband of 17 years, wanted a divorce. So that was a major challenge because Oh my goodness. Yeah. So you combine COVID with that and I had to completely reinvent not just myself personally, but the yeah. business. Because yeah. you know, we relied on um you know that partnership financially yeah. to keep going. So I had, you know, when he went his separate way, I had to pretty much um know that I had to keep the doors of my business open because beverage is very rarely profitable um, until, you know, even when it's sold, like 97% yeah. of all beverage companies still aren't yeah. profitable. Yeah. So, you know, then keeping the doors open, yeah. I had to form a board of advisors and mm-hmm. which was super helpful because, you know, if I, I brought in some industry veterans who mm-hmm. really 
um, people with a lot of experience in business Mm -hmm. to help me navigate those waters. And Mm -hmm. I just did a local outreach um, and raised enough capital to keep keep the doors open. But Mm. there was a time in the last year when I was very worried that I wouldn't be able to, to, you know, to keep things going. But Mm -hmm. I, I feel a huge responsibility to, you know, the, the 35 families and yeah, that are dependent on the business. So I did everything within my power to make sure that we could keep going. And we did, I mean, we're in great shape now, only seven months later. So, yeah. But boy, the longest seven months you've probably had it at oh, least in the longest I, time. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really, really tough time personally and professionally. But yeah. um, navigated the waters and thank goodness um today I couldn't be more optimistic about um not just my own personal life, but the business life. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I wonder and if you're if you if you're willing to talk about it, the husband and wife relationship in business it can be really powerful. Mm-hmm. And even when it is powerful, usually it's tricky. And, w- you know, I, I find it incredibly brave that you decided to go into this business with your husband. Like, that's a big deal. And I wonder, I don't well, know if there's... Very, yeah, he, I'm sorry. I mean, I just want to interrupt and just yeah. let you know, he wasn't that involved with the day-to-day oh, except okay. for one except for one year, which gotcha. was the, the year before we got a divorce. And that's gotcha. probably why we got a divorce. Oh. But he was very hands-off for most all of the the business. Okay. Until, yeah. Until, until that year. time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 I applaud anybody who goes into business with family, period. You know, yeah. I think whether it's a, 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 you know, a married family member or a blood family member, I think those relationships are so precious and sometimes fragile. And um, when you have the stress of running a business and wanting to make it profitable, those first few years are never easy. So I I applaud you for um, working through that. I know you guys are at a place that probably works best for both of you now. Um, And I'm glad to hear that you've got, you pulled this team together, this external team together. How did you go about networking those teams? Did you go and find them? Did you ask for help? Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um, There's a lot of fun stories behind the people that are here, but um, Dale, he's my CEO. He runs our day to day. He was with Coca-Cola actually running um, the biggest plan in the Pacific Northwest, which was one of their biggest facilities. Okay. Had like 1600 people under him in Bellevue. Oh and my then goodness. Um, he worked there for years and then came back to Arizona. Um, and he got a, just a cold call from a headhunter and that worked for wild tonic. And he's like, he never takes those calls, but he did. So he left Coca-Cola to come be with us, and he's been my CEO now um, for about a, a year. But he mm. was um, prior to that, um, he was in different roles in the company, and just really he was COO before that, and just gotcha. really proved out his uh, leadership abilities and skills. Gotcha. So without him, I don't know what I would do. Mm. Um, yeah, and then we've got uh, Jim Sanders from Wild Turkey Distillery. He came okay. to me four years ago. He was one of three people that really ran the distillery for Wild Turkey and helped build it. Mm-hmm. And he's a brilliant science mind. So I'm the crazy artist. He's the scientist. <laughs> we work really well together. Um, we we just got a, a fabulous team and a, oh, a woman wonderful. named Jesse. Um, who works in Phoenix and works on sales. Um, and another super important person who is extremely loyal and hardworking uh, is Bill Hazelwood. And he mm. used to be with Boston Beer running their Angry Orchard division. He was with, with them for a decade. Yes, one I knew that. that all, name. Yeah, one, one really wonderful thing that all of these folks have in common yeah. is that they've all been with the company for a very long time and they all are loyal. Yeah, And that's something that really is the thread that ties us all together is, you know, we, we all have been through hell and back, you know, yeah. building this company and yeah. we all really stand behind each other, support each other, love each other. It's really a family. Mm-hmm. I love hearing that. And yeah. so important to have those advisors, if nothing more than to just kind of get you to 
at least for me, step for me, I need to settle down. Here's Mm -hmm. right. Let's do a little reality check. It's going to be okay. Let's do this next thing. Yeah. Or those are great ideas that kind of just that external processing and then the expertise that they bring certainly rounds Mm -hmm. everything out. It's awesome. Yeah. When you're thinking back to, you know, the last several years here, what, what do you feel would, is your proudest moment right now? I know that will change tomorrow and it was different last mm-hmm. week, but when you're thinking about it, what are you proud of right now? Well, you're going to, a couple of things, two things really stand out. One of them I thought of before the podcast and then one of them, but when I just came into Haven's office. So one of them is that the LA Dodgers um, took our drink on and they drink it in their, in their clubhouse. Really? They drink it on a regular basis. They have been for years and their performance coach wrote us this beautiful letter of recommendation saying what an important role wild tonic has had in their, um, in their development as a team. And Mm -hmm. just because it's a healthy, energizing drink. Mm -hmm. And that was huge. They even flew out one of our, um, people from the brewery to one of their games and when they played the Yankees in New York because they needed to have wild tonic at the game. So that was really fun. So we brought out cases of it and then they invited us to their spring, um, training here in Phoenix, which Mm -hmm. is very cool. Um, but then I came into the office and I'm like, Oh my gosh, we got all of these. Um, I'm going to hold them up. All of these flavor medals, like, for oh. all of the competitions we've ever entered. And I guess they're in the HR office right now because they need to be, they need to be framed. But yes, um, we've entered our, our brew into a lot of the national beverage competitions and, and we always seem to come out with a medal. So that's oh kind of my fun. gosh, that is yeah. so fun. Yeah, I love that. I think- I didn't think of that. They were just on Haven's desk. So I thought, Thank okay. you, Haven. Thank you, Haven, yeah. for having that on your desk. Haven's amazing. She's an amazing HR person. you always got to have that too. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about where this, um, you list yourself as Queen Bee or somebody has on your website. Is uh, t- Talk a little bit about, the, it seems like there's a little bit of pride with that uh, title. No, there isn't. Actually, I'm very, I think humility is important. It yeah. takes like all my courage to do podcasts and to do interviews. <laughs> like, I, yeah. you know, I, I, in fact, one of the reasons I took the title of Queen Bee is because it just makes people smile. And it's like, they think, you know, it's just outside of the box. I don't yeah. feel like um, founder, or CEO, whatever. I just, those to me are just too dry and yes. too... I mean, we're a very outside of the box company, Mm -hmm. how we think, what we do, our partnerships, um, you know, with the local bee people, uh, local bee chapters that uh, teach people about beekeeping. All of that is is more about who we are. And I just wanted to be um, bee centric. (laughs) Oh, man, I love that. Nice job. Uh, well, I want to just kind of take a little bit of a zag here for a moment. Uh, I've interviewed a few people on kind of in this beverage space, different kind of beverages, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and over the last couple of years, many women in the beverage category. And we're still, you know, I, I want to talk about this, not like a, in, a, in a negative way per se. We're still mm-hmm. not seeing a whole lot of women leadership in the beverage category. And I'm wondering... Sure since that's such an important part of your, per, your personal professional development is wanting to work with other women in this space, what kind of changes have you seen since 2015? And, and maybe w- where do you think more support could possibly be going? So one thing I've seen, which I was really happy about um, is Constellation Brands came out with a $10 million grant for women, you know, women who are in beverage to just specifically to support women in beverage oh, really? and it's not something that I applied for or went for, but just the fact that it's out there and it's for women specifically developing alcohol. Okay. Beverage brands. But that's something to look at on their website. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's really um, it's really hard industry to break into unless you have a lot of capital. So I would say that seeing banks that had um, you know programs for women entrepreneurs that would fund them because you really can't get a bank bank loan unless you're profitable, and that right. almost never happens in beverage. I mean, it's just 
not the point. The point is to really grow your company as fast as you can to be a major player. Mm -hmm. And then a larger conglomerate typically acquires the company, which Mm -hmm. is what happened with um, KVita when Pepsi acquired it, you know, things like that happen. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's it's really, uh, it's a challenging industry to break into uh, without a tremendous amount of capital behind you. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like um, private equity is doing a kind of a strong enough job when it comes to the beverage? I'm seeing more and more effort on the, on the food and the snacking side uh, of supporting women. I don't necessarily think I have visibility well enough to say if I'm seeing that so much on the beverage side, did you see that there's more effort there right now or no, not really. No, uh, most of most of our supporters who have really gotten behind the brand are just wealthy angel investors, you know, mm-hmm. not private equity. So mm-hmm. and I'm definitely on the radar of private equity, but it's just too early in our life cycle yeah. to be mm-hmm. considering uh, partnerships, you know, maybe mm-hmm. in another year. Mm-hmm. Um, but the terms when you tend to negotiate with those private equity firms can be very oppressive um, unless you have some, you know, unless you have a lot of strength behind you. Got it. Interesting. Okay. And so you don't want to give away your company. (laughs) Yeah. And I would assume that, you know, you know, uh, when we're looking at more March, even more marginalized groups, you know, outside Mm -hmm. of women, we start to look our, at our um, sisters of color and those with disabilities. It's just even, more yeah. challenging for them to break into this space if if we're talking about yeah. uh, the, the term oppressive is pretty heavy so that really it says something a lot about what you're seeing as you're navigating these types of investment relationships right yeah I, it's not it's not easy but I would say that one um, thing that has really helped me is Mm -hmm. the EIDL loan, um, E-I-D-L loan. Uh So that was something that came uh, about because of COVID. And it's just a a SBA loan to businesses. And I think they just increased it up to $2 million. So you can really um, get a good chunk of money from the government with very favorable payback. Ooh, uh, terms because to of COVID. So there's some silver linings to COVID and you always have to really look for the silver linings in ev- any, you know, difficult situation. Yeah, for sure. Well, mm-hmm. kind of going back to that, that kind of that mentorship component that you just take so much pride in. As you're talking with other women who are either in the industry or interested in the industry what sort of advice do you find yourself giving or do you wish that you could spread a little bit more liberally instead of in one-on-one mm-hmm. conversations? Mm-hmm. So I would say this is going to sound um, very Sedona. So <laughs> just know that going in. But one thing that really changed everything in my life, um, which I started practicing about six months ago, was when I was in my toughest, darkest time, is just doing a daily gratitude meditation. And, you know, that uh, is so powerful, you know, and another um, group of women who are in beverage, um, who did a lot of the branding for White Claw and some yeah. very iconic brands, Grey Goose, mm-hmm. they shared this gratitude meditation with me. And because it's something that had worked for them, it's a 21 day gratitude meditation. If you just type that into YouTube, 21 day gratitude okay. meditation and okay. watch it. Absolutely life changing because everything mm-hmm. just started falling into place when I started exuding that energy of gratitude and um, being thankful for what I already had, as mm-hmm. opposed to focusing on the challenges. Mm-hmm. You know, focus on you know just the simplest things in life, and then the way the universe works is it wants to it wants to then mirror back that and bring good things your way, more things to be grateful for. Yeah. Well, and in effect, you're rewiring your brain to start looking for those things, right? Like, yeah. so if you eat sugar and yeah. you keep eating sugar, your body looks for sugar. But if you eat yeah. fruit, then your body starts looking for that. So I can understand the gratitude journal. It's so interesting. I am um, in the process of um, getting my MBA. And in the oh, first, oh, thank you. 
And the first six months is leadership development exclusively. No charts and graphs, no math yet. No, you know, none, mm. none, of, the, none of the stuff that will wow. be probably the bigger challenge for me. But um, a gratitude journal is actually one of our homework assignments. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, oh, that's fabulous. Well, it's, it is, it was for me life changing. And I yeah. highly recommend it because if I stop doing it, you know, I find I'm not as optimistic going into my day. Uh-huh. And, and just starting your day with that energy and that tone, you know, it, is uh, the universe response. Yes, agreed. And it could be Arizona, but who cares? Let's spread it around the world because <laughs> every, everybody needs a little bit of that right now, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Definitely. Holly, I, I'm really enjoying our time together and we're just kind of getting towards the end of the of the questions. But I, I always have these last three that I ask everybody. Um, the first one is, I like it. I like to call it a happy hour tidbit, something I can share with my friends when I'm out having a drink. Do you have some sort of like factoid or some interesting, something interesting about Jun kombucha or honey or even art? I would say, um, I would say that one thing that's always fascinated me about honey is that it never goes bad. Like they have honey back from, you know, 5,000 years ago that really? is from the Egyptian times that's still viable as a food source. And, you know, it's just a remarkable, it's the only food that won't go bad. So I think that's something, especially during times when people are looking at putting away a store of food, <laughs> make sure you have your honey in there because make it's sure. all the it's also considered a whole food. So it, it's um, absorbed by the body yeah. in a way that's very, very different. Um, you know, it's it absorbed as a whole food. And here's another interesting little fact, too. It, not a, about honey necessarily, but okay. about, um, you know, the body and the importance of fortifying your microbiome. Um, there is more foreign DNA in your body than there is your own DNA because of your microbiome. Really? So 80% of our immune system is in our gut because there's about eight pounds of bacteria in, in, our, in our gut and you oh have to have good bacteria yes. in order to thrive and to be healthy. And so when you drink something like wild tonic, you're fortifying the good bacteria in your yeah. system. And so, yeah, just to think, wow, there's more foreign DNA in my body than there is my own that's a pretty profound thought yeah that's i yeah. find the body to be so completely magical i mean i i we've got i know we've got science and science will continue to be like uh, solving or answering questions and solving things but i think there will always be well then what what d- makes that happen and why does that happen yeah. and um this concept of how we use food, how we use beverages, how do we hack our system? How do we use natural, you know, ancient ways of hacking our system to perform better for the future? So fascinating. Mm, So true. So true. Yeah. And my next question is, uh, are there any other women leaders or possibly even rising stars out there in our industry or not that you would like to elevate or simply admire for the work they're doing right now? Yeah, I actually, um, it's a kind of fun story and relates to Wild Tonic. About maybe a year ago, I got a just a cold call out of the blue from um, the the manager for the singer Jewel. And Jewel, much like me, you know, she sang uh, "Who Will Save Your Soul," a lot of really iconic songs yeah. and and beautiful voice, incredible voice. But she grew up in Alaska, like I did, and. Um, saw an incredibly meteoric, you know, career as a singer. And now she has a foundation in Las Vegas, um, which is why her, the, her president of her company was calling me because he wanted to bring Wild Tonic in to, to share with the children there who Mm -hmm. they mentor, children who come from very difficult backgrounds Mm -hmm. who then, um, are given the right, um, schooling and Mm -hmm. and environment to really Mm -hmm. rise to their best self. And so um, she's a huge fan of Wild Tonic, too, actually was able to deliver a product to her and tell your during um, during COVID, which was super really fun. she's an amazing person. Just she uses her creativity in a way to bring good things to the planet and to the world. And I 
truly admire that about her. What a great experience and connection to make. Mm, uh, those, those are the, those are the moments that, um, that really kind of make you go, okay, I'm, I'm pointed in the right direction. You know, yeah, at least that's I, how, how I would exactly. see it. <laughs> and I would love to have a foundation like her someday that helps other people that helps yeah. the planet, that helps the environment, that yeah. does more research on the bees, you know, mm-hmm. that, you know, I, and I think that when I meet, and then another one of my friends, um, you know, also has a, a foundation that he, he started kettle chips and yeah. Kona Brewing, and they have a foundation that gives back to the environment. And he's actually on one of um, Jeremy's podcasts as well. Oh, okay. And, yeah. So his name is Cameron Healy and watching what he's done for the environment, both yes. in Hawaii and in Oregon, where he, he lives, it, it's, it's been super inspiring too. Oh my goodness. So people like that. Yes. Yes. Well, what brands or trends do you have your eye on and why? It doesn't have to be in beverage. It could be in any category. That's a good question. One thing I'm working on right now is an adaptogenic tea that really helps the body have energy without caffeine and okay. you know, gives a sustainable, a sustainable mm-hmm. buzz. So that's something that I'm, I've got, I have in the, in, on the back burner right now until we can really have a yeah. more funding to bring out a new product line because it's mm-hmm. pretty expensive to do that. But I have the beverage already developed, which I'm excited about. Ooh, yeah. That's, that's ooh. Yeah. That, that is right. I know the, those adapt, the adaptogens are still uh, not completely mainstream. I feel like we're right on that tipping point of, of, um, normalizing it with kind of the gen pop, right? I think we're yeah. still on the front end of that, but excited about what that can do for our health in general. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, when I drink it, I have so much energy. I'm like, oh my gosh, I just got to share this. You know, I've got to share this with people. But I love it. I in love it. In, when it's ready, when it's ready. Well, we have been talking with Holly Lyman, the queen bee, and founder of Wild Tonic. Holly, where can people learn more about you? Um, at our website, wildtonic.com. There's a uh, find us section on there. If you type in your zip code, it'll give you the stores near you where you can actually find the drink. Um, and we're at Whole Foods and Safeway, a lot of the more mainstream grocery uh, channels. Um, but that's the best way to find us in your area. Okay. Thank well, you I'll, so much, yeah. Diana. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time today and for all that you do. I'm excited to uh, see you. I, I'm excited to see what's next for you. And I want to talk to you about some honey. I want to, after we log off this honey in uh, that's coming out of Mexico that you might want to have some heads up on. And uh, yes, very, very interesting. But Uh, I want to thank everybody else for their time today. Have a great rest of your day. And I really look forward to catching up with you on the next episode. Thanks so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you haven't already, be sure to click subscribe and share with your network. Until next time, be well and do gooder. Gooder.